dedicated ministry work, and, and now he's going to start another work. And we heard about the camp up there in, in, uh, and the camp in the church up in northern Australia. It took 25 years to find a national pastor. And I imagine that guy's probably going to go and start another work. Yep. There you go. Work, work of a Christian doesn't stop. And it's, it's so amazing. It is. Uh, I need some help for the next, next part. Okay. I had several people wanting to, to help. But let me see. You know, I'm going to take Miss McKinley and Matthew. Okay. Y'all can help. Did you do your Bible trivia? We had our bulletin. There was four questions in our Bible, our Bible trivia in the bulletins. Okay, these, you, can see, you read these. All right, open them up, read them. Find the announcements in there. That way, when uh, I say that we have an event, and I say, "Hey, we have a meeting on Tuesday," and you say, "What time's the meeting?" Well, it's in the bulletin. But there's other things in the bulletin. In this case, is Bible trivia. So we're going to let you get a piece of candy if you get the question right. And uh, Matthew, I'm going to have you go. From this section, you get three sections today, Matthew, okay? This, this one, this one, and this one. Those are your sections, okay? Miss McKinley, these are your sections. Can you get that? You got it? Okay, don't go anywhere yet, all right? Now, first question. You all ready? Okay, you can quickly go, just don't fall. Got it. Okay, that's easy, right? Just don't fall, all right? Safely, don't fall. All right, first question, raise your hand if you got this answer. In what church were the disciples first called Christians? It's Crystal. Antioch. In Antioch. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So let's do this. If you had the answer right, raise your hand. Just looking at the answer. Raise your hand. Guys, go on out and find hands raised and give them a piece of candy. Okay? Raise them high because Miss McKinley's only two and a half feet tall. Okay? She can't see above everything. All right. You can't take so long on the bowl there, Joe. They're doing pretty good, aren't they? Matthew, come over here and help out McKinley. If your side is done, help out this side. Raise your hand if you didn't get it yet and you got the right answer. All right, and what was the reference? Acts 11.26. Acts 11.26. Who got the reference for it? I know that wasn't a part of the question. Yeah, normally it is. But if you got the reference, I will give you a bonus piece of candy. So here we go. Miss Crystal's got it. Uh, Miss Nola's got it. Miss Hall has it. If you're done, McKinley, why don't you come back over here and stand by me? Gabby, you're trying to smooth candy. She is. All right, Miss McKinley, don't be deceived, okay? Why don't you come on back here? All right, next question. Next question. Who were the leaders at the church of Corinth that Paul stayed with? They were two of them. Who were the leaders at the church of Corinth that Paul stayed with? All right, yes, ma'am. Absolutely correct. Aquila and Priscilla. If you had Aquila and Priscilla, go ahead and raise your hand. McKinley, you can give him some candy. It's okay. I got the answer. Let's <laughs> say, is she four yet? Is she four? Yeah. We'll get him started early. All right, look for raised hands. If you raise your hand, she will come. If you don't raise your hand high enough, she will not come. You see, there's the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. <laughs> if we just raise our hand. <laughs> well, if you got the reference, I would love the reference, Miss McKinley. Look, you forgot. Miss Barbara, in the back. <laughs> All right, what's the reference? Woo, I think they did it together. <laughs> All right, if you got Acts 18, go ahead and raise your hand. Acts 18, Acts 18. 
Well, Matthew, they got the answer over there for the this, for this scripture. All right, next question. So I'm going to move on to the next question. See, I've got to pick fast, all right? Uh, what did the apostles appoint in every church? What did the apostles appoint in every church? Okay, neat. Elders, elders you are absolutely correct. Okay, the apostles appointed elders in every church. If you got that answer, raise your hand. All right, go. If you see hands raised, McKinley, if you see hands raised, all right, go give him some candy. All right, look in the back. Hey, Mr. Keehan in the back. And then who had the reference for that? Ms. Nola? Acts 14, 23. Yep, it's found in Acts chapter 14. Wonderful. All right, go ahead and uh, if you had the reference, 1423, somewhere around there. Okay, Ms. Nola. She's going to load up on sugar. Kids, y'all find her. She's got candy. All right, next question is the last question. Uh, which church sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey? Which church sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey? Elijah. Antioch, Antioch again. All right. They were first known as Christians in Antioch, and they also sent out their, those missionaries. All right. Raise your hand if you got that. Antioch. You can go. You got it. Go give them candy. Hey, Miss McKinley, if they don't pick quick, you can just chuck them a piece. Here. It's okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, and what was the reference? Oh, Miss Barbara, you forgot Miss Barbara in the back. What was the reference, Miss Crystal? Acts 13 2. <laughs> Chapter and verse. <laughs> Okay. They're both right. <laughs> so if you had that, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. You got the reference. Huh? Oh, you just give one. No, no. I meant the reference. Oh. Yeah. We're going to go with that. <laughs> if you got Acts 13 then you're in the right ballpark. So. <laughs> All right, everyone get your answers. Everyone got your questions. Okay, we're going to have Kerry come, and he's going to lead us in another song, and we'll have the offering after that. And you guys get three pieces each. Okay, three pieces. All right, you can go ahead and stand up and turn to number 657 with me.
been a good time this morning up here, so <laughs> all day today. Precious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for such a blessed and beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we just come together and worship just as a family, children of Christ, Lord. We thank you so much for the promise that you've given to us in heaven. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunities we have just to learn more about your word, to go out and spread more about your word, Lord. We thank you so much for people like Bob McGee and his family that are willing to go to different places in harm's way, Lord, and continue to spread your word and stand in the gap. Lord, we thank you so much for those people. We thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to support them as well. Lord, as we give back just a portion that you are so gracious to given to us, Lord, we just ask that it be for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we pray for all these things in Christ's dear and precious name. Amen.
You know, I believe that uh, y'all just decided to do that one tonight. That sounded great. That sounded great. That's like, kind of like if I practice something, that's about how much I'm... Actually, no, I can't even claim to sound that good. Uh, I can't even sound that good if I try and practice. So I really do appreciate people that can make a melody like that. Amen. And then I get to listen to that in the house every single day. Um, that's how I know my daughter's home is when the piano's playing. <laughs> I was upstairs and, and studying tonight, or this, uh, this afternoon before we came, and uh, we got a recliner in the, in the room, so I'm just kicked back and got my Bible and got my computer and everything set up. And next thing I know, I hear the piano playing downstairs. I'm like, well, Belle's home. And that's about it. If, if, she's, uh, if she's doing anything, she finds time to work on the piano. And uh, you can see that. Um, and I love kids that they dive into music. Right? I think of uh, Nathaniel Cattell's. He's only 15 years old, and he is an accomplished pianist. Jeremiah Cattell's son uh, down in Portsmouth. And um, can you believe this? Like, Two years ago, when this kid was 13 years old, he was trying to memorize every hymn in the hymn book. Not just the words, but how to play it on the piano. And then we saw yesterday at the senior adult conference at the Edge, you had the Rains family. And Miss Natalie Rains playing piano, 33 weeks pregnant. But she was whipping out hymns all over the place. And they had a, a time where they were saying, you know, stump Natalie time. You know, um, I don't know why they called it Stump Natalie time until it was a gigantic pick a hymn night. And then people picked all kind of crazy hymns. They were like, Crossroads only. And she was like, got it. Uh, you know, this one, that one. This. And I think uh, she only didn't know like maybe three, maybe two. And uh, she put her entire life into music. And some people can just do that. That's the gift that God gives them. So, you know, serve God with the gifts God's given you. And it's going to be a joy for you all. Plus, her daughter was fantastic. A little 15 a month old, I think, uh, Raylan. Raylan was great. And then they got another baby coming, and uh, that family was, uh, uh, that was a joy to be around. Um, message was great, too. And I might take a point of his message and try to tie it into what we're going to talk about tonight. So I said all that to say, uh, to say this. Let's uh, open your Bibles and turn to Romans 14. And we're going to be there for the evening. Romans chapter 14. It's great when you try to apply your time towards uh, hearing the Word of God and giving out the Word of God and living the Word of God. Because when you try to do anything otherwise, um, it's not profitable. We want we to stay away from that. Let's go ahead and pray. At first, uh, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds to pray that you all got there, Romans chapter 14. Good? Wonderful. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the evening that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time to relax today. Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the grace that you have given us, Lord. And I praise you so much for coming and dying on that cross for us and for lifting us up, Lord Jesus, out of the miry clay, Lord. The Bible says that this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. So I thank you that you saved us and that you've given us the opportunity to tell others how to get saved. Lord, I pray that you please bless what we're going to uh, hear and bless what I'm going to say. Let me get out of the way and let it be your words only. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 14, like I said. Um, I had a great time this morning talking about, uh, talking about the call of God and people that reject it, people that are on the fence about it, and then people that just wholly accept it. And... Um, a little bit of review, who was part of those people that just that accepted the Word of God? <laughs> who, who was part of those people that accepted the Word of God? Yeah, the thief on the cross. Okay, the thief on the cross accepted the Word of God. The woman at the well accepted the Word of God. All right, who else accepted the Word of God that we went over this morning? Zach? Okay. The centurion, there we go, someone that we did not go over, he accepted the word of God. Okay, we have the one at the well, Ms. Deborah? The good Samaritan. The good Samaritan, okay. That was a great story. Um, thinking of. The woman with the issue. Yeah, the Samaritan, the woman at the well, the issue, woman with the issue of blood. Okay, the reason I bring that up is that's just all of us. Okay, you got thieves, you got crooks, you got uh, people with... Um, 
bad lifestyles, you got uh, religious people, you got demonically oppressed and depressed people, uh, all walks of life. And that's where we come from. And our backgrounds, God uses those. And He lets us minister to others. And we can use that knowledge from our background. We can use that lifestyle that we did lead. And then we can further glorify God in saying, hey, this is what God has saved me out of. And uh, man, it was great hearing those testimonies from the conference yesterday. And we had, you always hear those testimonies, people getting up and saying, you know, God saved me when I was this, this uh, number of years old and he saved me out of drinking and he saved me out of this and he saved me out of that. And then here you got Ms. Natalie Rain saying, God saved me when I was five. So a life like that, you know, that is wholly devoted to God. But carries no less weight when you're trying to minister to people that need Jesus. All right? God puts everyone specifically in a place to hear from a specific person. I believe that. And I believe that God is willing to use you specifically to reach other specific people. All right? Carrie, your people are not Ms. Hall's people. All right? That means you've got to pay attention to the people that God is leading you to. Uh, that's not part of the message. That's free. Um, anyway, we're in Romans chapter 14, and let's look in verse number 16. We're going to start off in 16 and finish the rest of the chapter. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, and, but it is evil to that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor any other thing whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. But whatsoever is not of faith, or for whatsoever is not of faith, is sin. We covered that, and now I'm going to give kind of a background to this passage that we just read. So the first part of Romans chapter 14 is talking about different Christians talk, are coming from different backgrounds. We have Jewish Christians that got saved from pagan lifestyles. They were Romans, they were barbarians, everyone like that. The whole like Greeks. Okay, they got saved, and now they are believers in Jesus, and they are followers of Jesus. And you have Romans, or not Romans, but you have Jews that came out of Judaism, and they got saved, and now they are followers of Jesus. Some of these are weak Christians. Some of these are strong Christians. Some of them have uh, backgrounds that they have trouble just uh, not letting go. Uh, speaking of people that came out of Judaism, they have people that um, have things that they are having trouble with letting go that came out of paganism, all these things, they have a history, and this shows up in the way that we treat each other as Christians. It really does. And we have to be very, very careful when we are um, making our claim about, uh, to, to one another about how strong a Christian we are, about how, uh, about how good of things I can do or how much freedom I have in doing things. We need to be careful because not everyone else has the same realization of their freedom in Christ. And that's important to know that. Okay, they actually do have the same freedom in Christ as you do, but the problem is they haven't gotten to where you are yet. If you're one of those people that knows this freedom in Christ and knows what you can do and knows what things are pure and knows your uh, ability to go and serve Him in every capacity, you also have people that maybe have just gotten saved. People that got saved out of uh, other backgrounds and not our um, home style or our American home style of life. There are so many different people out there in the world. So many different kinds. You can ask Brother McGee, and he's probably seen um, many people throughout Australia that, uh, I just said that with an accent, I didn't even try. <laughs> that, um, and you talk to them, and I guess, I don't know, you consider them probably people from the bush or other kind of uh, areas where they have a firm belief in something that is not Christian. So when people are getting saved out of that, they still hold on to that mentality for a while. And they still hold on to some of those traditions and you have to uh, let Christ work it out of them. And it's like a baby. Have you seen a baby walking around in a room full of marbles? What does that baby do? Shoves them in their mouth. All right? 
What does that make us like as baby Christians? Walking around in a room full of marbles, picking up things that shouldn't be in your mouth and shoving them in your mouth. And the growth of a Christian is God picking those things out of your mouth and freeing yourselves out of those dangers and cleansing your life. That's how he treats us. Why? Because you are babes in Christ when you get saved. And there's a babe in a room full of marbles. Constant supervision is required, is it not? We can't leave a baby in Christ unsupervised. When I say unsupervised, you have to come and you have to come alongside them and you have to mentor them. Because it's dangerous to let a new believer kind of go off and figure out life on her own. It's dangerous to let a toddler go off and figure out life in a room by itself. So in our freedom in Christ, we have to know certain things. Yes, you're free to serve Christ. You're not condemned. We have therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We have none of that. But there are still people that hold on to certain things. Okay? So my first thought in living our Christian life is we have to keep the main thing the main thing. Now some people can be ardent heralds about different aspects of the Christian life. Okay, we believe that, uh, well, we don't have drums up here in the back. Okay? That's something that we don't have. Some people, for example, I'm going to get into the questionable things later, but we believe a Christian is not supposed to drink alcohol. We believe a Christian is not supposed to commit adultery. We believe all of these things that are in precept in the Word of God. And we would tell people that. But when we have things that are questionable things, that maybe it mentioned in the Old Testament, but people don't really realize that they have freedom in Christ to do these things. And and we're going to go over some examples of that. So the main thing for a Christian is that we stay holy and pure before God. Okay, when you look at verses 16 through 18, look at that. It says, let not your good be evil spoken of. What happens when you offend a younger brother, when you, when you offend a, a weaker Christian, a new believer? They're going to get offended and they're going to start talking bad about what you're doing. Let not your good, you may be doing great. You may be telling the truth, but let not your good be evil spoken of. They may be offended by your actions or something that you have or something that you're uh, speaking against. They may be offended by it. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What is the main thing? Keep yourself pure before God, for first and foremost. So those things that we talked about, okay? The alcohol, all the other things that are spoken directly about in the Bible, do not do. The things that affect your purity, do not do. And that's how we maintain our righteousness with God, okay? You keep your relationship with God, and when you have that um, in your life, when you have that purity in your life, you have that joy in the Holy Ghost, you have that, uh, that fellowship with the Holy Ghost that is inside of you when you're living the way that God wants you to live. Verse number 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace. Not just peace with God, but peace with your fellow man. Because you're called to be peacemakers, aren't you? You can easily offend someone by doing something good. You can. Okay? Enjoying the Holy Ghost. You cannot have peace with another person unless you have joy inside of you. Unless you have your relationship is, is right this way, you cannot have your relationship right that way. And I know this is kind of simple, but we're laying the groundwork first. You have to keep the main thing the main thing. Make sure that if you don't want your good to be evil spoken of, you are doing good. Okay? You are doing what the Bible is telling you should do. You are doing what the Holy Ghost is leading towards you to do. Okay? That levels that playing field out. What is the main thing? It is the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So, what about when things aren't as clear? Did you know that there's areas in life that are not clearly stated? You can go to the Bible and you can find where in the Bible it says you cannot do something, but then we find this passage that tells about a freedom in Christ where you can do something, so, where does a believer stand on that? I uh, knew a guy who used to be a pastor. Would not eat pork. Would preach from the pulpit against pork. What's wrong with pork? The Bible said it was an unclean animal. 
But now in several other passages, when you start the Bible, we'll find out that nothing is unclean to us when it's eaten given in a thanksgiving to God. Nothing is unclean. So what's wrong with some bacon? Right now there is nothing wrong with bacon. You can have bacon. You have freedom in Christ to eat bacon. Isn't that a wonderful thing? But there are people that come out of different backgrounds, a Jewish background, for example, where pork is an unclean animal. And if you have someone that's still holding on to that, and they get saved, and the only thing they know is they are going to heaven. That's the only thing to know. That's a great thing to know, though, isn't it? But the only thing they know is they're going to heaven, but they see you pop a, uh, a slice of bacon, and they see you uh, slap a pork chop down on a skillet, and they look at that, and they're going to freak out. And you're going to cause them to offend. This is the kind of thing we have to be careful of. You and your freedom of Christ are free to do all that. You're free to eat bacon. All right, if you want to, you're free to use a Christmas tree in your house. You have the Christian liberty to do that. You're free to have a dream catcher in your house if you want to. Who knows what a dream catcher is? The only reason why I know what a dream catcher is is because I spent uh, time up in Alaska where I met my wife, and she knew what a dream catcher was, so she told me. So um, she explained it was something like a little decoration that the native Alaskans would use to catch those spirits floating around. So that thing, even though it's a nice little handmade decoration, was used in another religion for religious purposes. So would that cause someone to offend? If they're brand new out of there, if they're not very far in their Christian walk, they would see something like that and say, oh, that's okay. They may get mad or they may look at it and say, that, that's okay to go back to my religion. I'm still saved if I go back to practicing that way. And we can see how what we do can become a stumbling block or cause people to offend. And there's other things. Christmas trees, uh, I mentioned that. I have a Christmas tree in my house. I've seen Christmas trees get, a, get preached against. Why is that? Because that song, Oh Christmas Tree, Oh Christmas Tree, you want to know where that came from? came from a German song where... Um, the barbarians up there where it used to be Germany and all that stuff, they say, oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum, they worship the trees. So that was an act of worship. A Christmas tree, adorning a Christmas tree and lights and everything was an act of worship back then. Did you know that we have Christian freedom to do that? Because to us, we're not worshiping a dead idol. What the Bible says is all those things are dead idols. That dream catcher represents a dead idol. That Christmas tree represents a dead idol. So you have freedom in Christ to actually use that. But just be wary. Be aware that it can cause a stumbling block in front of someone. It can cause offense. What you do can cause offense. What about the language we use? All right, the Bible does say that we have to uh, be mindful of our conversation. We have to be mindful of the way that we speak. So does that mean only you are, are not supposed to curse? Does that mean only? No, it doesn't. What about the manner in which you speak to people? What if you have someone that gets saved out of a rough lifestyle? The only thing they hear from their parents is negative, 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 yelling, 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 cursing, and this and that and the other. And they get saved, and the only thing they know is, I am going to heaven. And then they hear Bob Believer down here has been saved for 20 years speak the exact same way as their dad. What do they think is going to be okay? I'm going to go back to talking like that because that's what I know and I don't have to learn a new vocabulary. And that's exactly what they're going to do. Our Christian liberty that we have, we need to be mindful. Okay, That doesn't mean don't use your liberty. I'm not saying that. I didn't give you your liberty. Christ gave you your liberty. But we have to be mindful in not causing others to offend. But what we're going to get to later is edify others. Because that's why you're here. Edifying others. Okay? People that watch NASCAR. I'm not going to preach against NASCAR, but other people can look at NASCAR and say, well, if these guys watch NASCAR, does that mean I can stay home and watch the whole race? They'll do that. Does that mean I can stay home and watch the whole Super Bowl? Does that mean I can miss out on evening service and watch the game? Does that mean I can miss out on this and go to a baseball game when I'm supposed to be in church? And we have to be careful about how we live our life. We have Christian liberty to do things, but we have to be wiser than that. We have to think about what we're doing, how we're edifying others around us. In verses 19, 
And uh, actually, we're not going to go there yet. But talking about food. All right. What if, a, what if someone were to come to you right now and say, I got this amazing brisket. And I love brisket. Do you like brisket? I mean, we're in Virginia. You were required to like brisket in Virginia. Okay. I have this amazing brisket. I had just offered it to Bale. You want to share? What would you say? No, thank you. You want to know what Paul would say? I got a knife. I got a fork. Why is that? Because it was offered to a dead idol. That is still an amazing cut of meat. I am hungry. Back then when the church of Corinth was around, the best cuts of meat that were offered to idols, they were often resold for the lowest price. So you want a nice, a nice steak with some terrific marbling on it? Go to the pagan grocery store down there. I mean, it's fantastic. 1 Corinthians 8, y'all look at it. Y'all, y'all study it out. But, in light of our Christian liberty, if you have someone that would be offended, that it would cause to be a stumbling block in front of that person, do you do it? No, you go to Food Lion and you go get a brisket from Food Lion. It may be three times the price, but it keeps that person from being offended. So we have to be mindful. Okay? We have to be mindful about what we are doing. Okay? It is better to not do and keep peace than to do and cause offense. Look at verse 19 with me, if you will. We're still in Romans 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Okay? We want peace. We want a peaceful relationship with the rest of our Christian brethren around us. We still have Christian liberty. I'm not taking that away from you. But we're seeking for peace. God called us to be peacemakers, and no one is going to be edified without that peace around us. They're going to seek to cause strife. They're going to seek to respond to whatever offense is there. But seek peace. It is better to not have. He says, let us therefore follow after the things which, which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy. Sorry, let me rephrase how I said that. For meat, that means you're doing something for meat, for something you have, for something you eat. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. If someone looks at you, again, baby Christian, the only thing I know is I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, looks at you and says, that is wrong. They're going to be offended at you. That's going to cause strife. We ought to seek to not do that. And those are for those question, or questionable things. Now, there was a time I know better about this, and I'm so thankful for, my, for the senior saints around us. I had a soul winning partner named Brother J.C. Brown. And he was as Texan as all get out. He was a cowboy who worked on oil fields in West Texas. And where was West Texas? I don't know. It was in the western part of Texas. The town is actually called West. All right, West Texas. He wore a cowboy hat wherever he went, cowboy boots. But he was probably the, the sweetest Christian guy you would know. And there at church, he'd be like the only guy saying amen. He'd be like, amen, brother. You know, kind of like that. And uh, my wife's mom came down to visit us one time, and she heard him. And she didn't remember his name, but she was like, hey, is brother amen still there? <laughs> but someone had given me this bottle. And this is me in my dumb youth. It was a big bottle. I used it for change, but it had a Budweiser label on it. Okay? I know now that that is not right, and I hope you don't have one of these things in there. But I had it in my house, and again, we were really young when we had this. And I had change in there, and he looked at it, and he said, you know, brother, that label right there, uh, that represents a wicked company. That represents a wicked thing. You probably ought not have it in your house. But I didn't realize that. And you know, here in Brother Brown's testimony, he got saved at 20 years old. He was a drunk. And when he got saved, he went and opened up all his bottles of liquor and poured them down the sink. So he knew what that was. He knew what kind of power, what kind of draw that had, but he was gracious enough to tell me in a way that wouldn't cause offense. And I appreciate that. But then I appreciate the attitude that people that, um, that are older Christians, our senior saints and everyone like that, that knows better, that can graciously inform someone when, when they don't know, even in a questionable area. But the key here is having peace when you do so. The key here is having 
uh, grace or showing grace, not condemning someone. Because it says earlier in the chapter, who's going to condemn another man's servant? And whose servant is that? The servant is Jesus Christ. Uh, we are serving him. We are serving the Lord. Who are you that judgeth another man's servant? Right. We're thinking of our questionable areas. Our questionable meaning is not laid out in precepts in the Bible. So, it's better to not do and have peace than to do and cause offense. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor, to, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. We're here to edify, we're not here to make weak. We're here to build up, we're not here to cause to stumble. We're not here to cause offense. You have liberty to do that. So how do you go and get about that? All right, what if you enjoy a good ribeye? And the only place you can get it is, you know, Pagan Line or, or something like that. Walmart's just as bad as a Pagan grocery store sometimes. Just go in there during Black Friday. Then you'll see that. But you go down there and you, know, you get your thing. Don't invite the new guy over for your steak dinner. Okay? If you really want your steak, you know, you have Christian liberty to do that. But don't do it in front of someone who would cause offense, who would stumble by it. You can still have your Christian liberty, but have it to yourself is what the Bible says. I probably uh, quoted that wrong and I forgot the passage, so I'm sorry. But it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor any other thing whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Now it says this. We've got to think of what we do from here on out. We heard all this good news. We heard all these instructions. What do we do with it? In verse number 22, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. You have that Christian liberty, enjoy that liberty. All right? If it's sinful, well, no, not sinful. That was the wrong word. If it would cause someone to offend by eating macaroni and cheese. If one person in here did not like macaroni and cheese, then don't eat macaroni and cheese in front of that person. There's nothing wrong with macaroni and cheese. You have Christian liberty to enjoy those creamy noodles and everything like that in there. And, uh, but don't do it in a way that would cause someone to stumble. All right, the whole idea is to edify, to lift up, and Jesus will work that out in that person. As long as they're growing in Christ, they're not going to be offended at it their whole lives. That's right. They're not going to be someone that's going to cause offense Amen. in there. And they're growing with their same Christian liberty that you have. So what do we do? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in anything which he alloweth. Okay? Don't cause someone to be to their conscience to condemn them in what someone else does. If you do something in front of them, don't cause someone to their conscience to condemn them. Uh, I'll give you another one. Who enjoys guns in here? I do have firearms in the house. All right? He would raise three hands if he had them. <laughs> So there are people that really, really like guns, but there are, other, there are those that get saved out of an environment where it is deemed that guns are the source of all this violence and, and, uh, and all this woe that is in their lives. And as this new Christian, they're going to look at guns and they're going to be offended. So what do we do? Don't walk around with your John Wayne, you know, four foot long six shooter on your hip, goes all the way down past your knee. You can seal that, okay? Or just don't have it near that person. Enjoy your Christian liberty, but don't cause your brother to offend. But here's something that we have to be careful for. In verse number 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you have your Christian liberty. You can do a lot of things in service to Christ. Okay? If it's not, if it's not spelled out, against it in here, and if it doesn't look bad on, on the testimony of Jesus Christ, you have liberty to do it. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's spelled out against this Bible, so don't go thinking you can do just about everything just because I told you that, okay? Get in your Bible and figure things out, but if you don't know, what's the best answer? Don't do it, okay? If you don't know, don't do it. It says here, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not in faith. I don't really know. That thing's offered to idols. Um, I don't know if it's offensive or anything. I don't know if God's going to like that. Or not. And you probably just haven't gotten to the point where 
uh, you know, it represents a dead idol or anything, but don't do it because your conscience is going to condemn you because of it. Right. Wait until God grows you to that point, okay? Man, that can open up so many things. You know, that lady is purdy, and she's nice, and she's well-behaved, and like she's fun to be around, but I just don't know if that's God's will for my life, but I really like her, and I don't see anything wrong with this. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and get married to her but you don't know? That can cause a world of problems, can it? Yeah, that can cause a world of problems. What about buying a car? Man, that is exactly the same kind of car, but I haven't looked under the hood. I don't know what the engine sounds like, but it's exactly the right thing that I want to look for. It's what I want. It's the dream car. I'm just going to go get it. But you don't know. We have to be careful about those things that we are unsure of in our time with our Christian walk. This is where it comes to y'all. This is where it comes to people that have been saved and been living the life for years and years and years and years to come and grab up those people that are weak in their faith and grab up those people that are, uh, that are struggling with certain things and be that testimony to them that Christ does work many, many things in their life. Okay, Like I said with Brother McGee, he is starting another work in Australia. The Christian life is not over. Okay, you keep on trudging on. It may take you a little longer to get up in the morning sometimes in your physical walk through the day. I'm trying to be nice and not saying you're old or anything. But, but God gives you the strength to do it every day. He really does. And I look at some of, the, uh, some of our senior saints in here, and I wish I had half the strength. I wish I could see half the strength that y'all do in my life right now. I really could. I really do. Because I look at the things that y'all have been through and the years and years and years that y'all have served Christ, and I'm thinking, wow, they have been through so many things, so many hardships, so many trials. We heard a message that Brother Rains preached over there yesterday, and uh, he was preaching on a point in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 where it talks about, uh, remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. They will be many. Remember those. Why is, it, why is the preacher telling you to remember those? Because you've been through those. And you've seen Christ work through those in your life. What does that make you? That makes you a beacon of an immaculate testimony of the way Christ can work through someone's life. And what's going to happen is you're going to go and you're going to grab up one of those younger Christians. You're going to grab up one of those younger people that just got saved, that don't know, that are walking around with the marbles in their life, in their mouth, and you're going to tell them how to pluck them out. And you're going to show them from the Bible how they can walk a straighter life. They can walk a straighter walk with Christ. Can Jesus show you everything you need to know in this book? He can. I believe that if you are stranded on a desert island, the only thing that you would need is food, water, and shelter, and this book. Okay? Saying that, I don't know how much someone is going to grow, but they can survive. What's going to cause them to grow is seeing the example of you and hearing your example, and seeing how you live out your life. That's going to cause someone to grow. That's going to cause them to walk a straighter path with the Lord. So if you see someone who may be struggling, they may be having a hard time with their Christian liberty, don't condemn them, okay? Because most of us know enough verses and things that are against God, and yeah, we're not supposed to condone any of that. But if you see someone that's struggling with, a, with something that they should be able to do, maybe it's the amount of time they spend in their prayer life. Maybe it's the time they spend in their Bible. Maybe it's, oh, I can't talk to that person because they're scary looking. I don't know what it is. But if you see someone that is struggling in their walk, be that person who has seen those days of darkness and has seen Christ weather them through those days of darkness. Be that person and just shore them up in love and edify them. And show them that Christian liberty works. Show them that liberty in Christ works. That is what I want you all to take away from this. There can be those questionable things. And we're not to condemn. We're not to judge. But show them Christ works. Well, that's all I got. I thought it'd be a
quicker, but I guess it wasn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was good. It was good. It was fun being up here. And man, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say y'all are dismissed. Minus my drivers for Saturday. <laughs> and thank y'all for coming. And hope you have a wonderful time this evening. Be safe on the way home. Be safe through the week. Uh, if you haven't gone to talk to Brother McGee, please go and talk to him. Make sure you get as much stuff as you can from our missionaries whenever they stop by. So, uh, yes, yeah, I am saying for them to tie up your evening. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the, the grace that you've given us, Lord, to do things, to serve you, Lord. We can esteem every day as it's the same because you're the Lord of every day, Lord. Thank you for that. And uh, I praise you for it. pray that you please help us and help us to go forth and and proclaim your name throughout the week. And uh, Lord, keep us strong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.